thank you guys all so much for being here. I'd like to thank the Cal Academy for hosting this event. I'd like to thank the Leakey Foundation in particular for funding a lot of what you're going to hear tonight. Um, I think my name has been on only four Leakey grants, but I've collaborated with people working on quite a number of other Leakey Foundation um, projects. And so almost nothing you're going to hear tonight has been not touched by the Leakey Foundation. They've been really behind the scenes on everything, and none of us could do what we can do really without their help and support. They are really ubiquitous in the field, and um, I can't really thank them enough. I'm so really thrilled to be able to be here and share some of what I've been working on for the last 20-some years. I'm interested in human evolution. Why do we care about human evolution? We care about human evolution because this is our story. This is where we began. And the story of evolution, in my opinion, always should start at the beginning. The best stories start at the beginning. So I'm interested in our origins and where we came from. But it's important to understand our ancestors, not to just know how we diverged from an ape-like ancestor millions of years ago, but also if we understand something about our beginning, then we understand what selection had to act on to produce ourselves or our genus Homo. So this is Lusty, who might be considered the poster child for human evolution. We'll talk quite a bit about her. She's oh, three million years ago and a member of a genus we call Australopithecus, which is originally named from South Africa, which means southern ape. And there's a whole group of species that belong to Australopithecus that gave rise to, ultimately, some of them did anyway, to our genus Homo. And this is an example of a Homo erectus skeleton um, from Kenya. But selection can only act on last year's model. And if we want to understand the sequence of events that led to our evolution, we need to know the beginning. We need to know what our ancestors were like. And then maybe we can say something about ourselves even today. So the stories I'm going to tell you today involve where we came from, but also in the process of studying that, saying something about what we are like today and actually has applications for things that we're seeing in the real world. And I'm going to talk about the shape of us. The talk is called The Shape of Human Evolution. And body shape is something that's fascinated me for a long time because we think of limbs and we think of hands and feet and arms and legs and how animals move around the environment. We think of heads and what they eat. But often, the shape of the body actually says a lot about our animal's biology. It houses all of our internal organs, carries babies, it anchors our limbs. It, it's different in animals with different sorts of posture. Even in Dr. Seuss's Cartoons here, you can see these three different animals have three pretty different body shapes. And body shape can tell us a lot about an animal's biology, so it can tell us a lot about our evolution. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about a number of lines of research that are coming together to give us a different picture of body shape and human evolution, and to maybe change some of our ideas about how we approach the study of evolution, approach our understanding, and may change the way we think about ourselves and how we got here. Who in this audience has never seen this picture? Oh, no hands are going up. Everyone's seen this picture. This is a very famous picture published in the early 1970s in Time Life, and it depicts, I think, what the public's general understanding of human evolution is like, and I think actually it, it depicts a lot of what scientists even have in the back of our heads about how human evolution progressed. We have an ape-like knuckle-walking ancestor here that slowly sort of starts to stand upright and stands up better and better and better until we're ourselves today. And this is iconic. It makes a really good cartoon. Who doesn't have a parody of this on a t-shirt or something in their office cubicle? It's funny. We all know it. We see it everywhere. But how valid and how accurate is this? So what I want to talk to you about a little bit today is how these idea is changing with our study of looking at body shape in human evolution. Now, when that diagram was made in the early 1970s, this is pretty much a summary of what we knew about human evolution. We had early creatures here, these Australopithecus fossils. They range in age from about four to one and a half million years. There's a bunch of different species we know now, but we didn't then. Then they gave rise to maybe Homo erectus and more human-like, and then eventually Neanderthals and modern humans. So it seemed like a reasonable depiction of how human evolution went. The fossil record looks a little bit more like this today, which keeps us all in a job because it's much more confusing and complicated, but it's all right for those of us who need to earn our living studying it because there's a lot more to do. We know that the human family tree is bushy. There are many different species at most all levels through time. It thins out towards the end. But it's a lot more complicated, and we have a lot more fossils, and we're getting a much more accurate and nuanced picture of how we evolved. 
And so what I'm going to talk about today is not just all those heads you saw in the previous slide, but about the bodies that carried those heads around and the shape, the shape of humans, what we are like, and how we got to be that way, and then what it says about the biology of our ancestors and how everything happened. Now, if you compare a human to, in this case, a gorilla or any sort of great ape, we know that great apes are our closest living relatives. We share lots of genes, a very recent common ancestor. But you look at the body shape of these two and you see a number of different things. Certainly the gorilla has huge long arms, shorter legs, grasping feet. But if you look at the torso right here in the middle, you can see it's got this big long pelvis, almost no lower back, cone-shaped rib, the big block of a torso here. Whereas we have a barrel-shaped rib cage, a nice long spine, a flexible waist that we use when we walk around, and a short pelvis. And these differences happened somewhere, sometime in our evolution, and actually have important implications. So why are apes built the way they are? Well, apes move about the world in a very different way than we do. We walk around, of course, upright on two feet. It's called bipedal locomotion. And an ape does things differently. Apes primarily are hanging in the trees. They eat ripe fruits. Fruits grow on the ends of branches. Apes tend to be big animals. So how do they get to small branches? As they hang below them. They distribute their weight over lots of different supports. They hang below the branches, and they can do what they need to do. To do that, they have a very stiff torso here, and they have a narrow rib cage at the top, which allows them to reach their hands very efficiently up over the heads when they're hanging and climbing. But as a consequence of having these big, long climbing arms, they have to walk on a very funny way where on the ground. Big, long arms, they can't really stand up straight, and they don't walk around that way. So somehow, this is a real difference that we need to explain by looking at the fossil record. You look at the torso, it hasn't really been studied very much, even though there's so much shape difference. Why? Well, it's made up of a lot of different bones, and when you go to a museum, they're all in a pile in a drawer, and you can't really see very well how they're put together. Also, they tend to be very fragile, and they don't show up nearly as often in the fossil record as things like teeth, which are hard, and they fossilize much more easily. But fortunately, we're learning more about them. But just recently, maybe as recently as 20, 30 years ago, our ideas weren't so good. And so this is the same sort of picture you saw before. We have a chimpanzee torso and a human. We've gotten rid of those pesky limbs. We don't need to talk about them today. And if you go up in almost any anthropology textbook, this is what you'll see Lucy look like. This is what Australopithecus torso looks like. It's got a short pelvis, which looks a lot like a human, which is related to upright bipedal locomotion. I'm not going to discuss that really today, but I'm happy to discuss it in question and answers. But if you look at the rib cage here, it's shaped like a cone, like this chimpanzee. And this is what we think Lucy looked like. Well, who cares? Well, here's why we care. This is the same reconstruction done in 3D. This is an old skeleton or an older reconstruction of skeleton um, from the Cleveland Museum done in the past. And when you do this, and you imagine with your eye sort of what this animal would look like put together, you imagine a shape sort of like this gorilla here, with this big pot belly, if you sort of connect the dots here, not much of a waist, a very different sort of a shape than you would see in you or me. This is important not just to get a vision in our heads of what Australopithecus might have looked like, but it has implications. If this was their shape, maybe it means she had a really large gut and ate difficult food. That's been discussed in the literature. Maybe did she have a waist? A waist is something we use when we walk. According to that reconstruction, there's not much of a waist. Could she move her hips when she walked? Not if she had a shape like that. Was she shaped like an ape? Would she have looked like that? Was she shaped like us? And what does all of this mean for our origins? If that's really what Australopithecus looked like, we have a very different kind of an animal than you or I, or you or me, I should say. Well, fortunately, the fossil record has been good to us, and people like Zarai have been working diligently in finding some terrific new fossil skeletons, a lot of which have parts of the torso. Lucy certainly has some. We have, some skele we have two skeletons of adult afarensis. We have Zarai's beautiful child skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis from a small baby that's still under study, but is going to have a huge amount to tell us about this whole question. Uh, we have a couple of skeletons of Australopithecus africanus, a couple of newer skeletons of Australopithecus sediba. So now we actually have some fossils to work with to really see, was Lucy really so ape-like as we thought? Well, what can we tell? What are the bones of the torso we can look at? One thing we can look at is the spine and the backbone. And if you look in side view, here's a human, and here's a chimpanzee, which is any, pick your favorite quadruped. And the backbone of most animals is a uniform arch that arcs forward and acts like a series of stones in an archway and works really well to support the body when you're on all fours. Humans, however, have decided to not be on all fours, 
And we had this series of sinusoidal curvatures in our spine, backwards in the neck, forwards in the torso, backwards in the lower back, causes us a lot of back pain to be built this way, but allows us to get our center of gravity up over our feet when we're standing on two feet while walking. You can try walking around all day bent forward like this. I dare you, but I bet you're going to be on taking a lot of ibuprofen the next night. It's not very comfortable, whereas this is very, very efficient. So would our ancestors have been bent forward like our time life drawing, something like this, or not? Well, we should be able to look at the vertebrae or the bones of the back and say something about that. And fortunately, we have quite a number of them now. This is an older reconstruction of Lucy, and if you stack the bones together, you can see that they have these curvatures. Here are a couple of other Australopithecus spines, and you can see that all of them have these curvatures in their back, just like modern humans do. And we can get out our calipers and our metrics, and we can measure these things, and we have done this in the scientific literature. And sure enough, we know that Australopithecus had spinal curvatures just like us. So why did they think they were hunched over in the first place? Maybe they weren't. Maybe they stood fully upright, right over their, over, over their legs, just like we did. So that's not very much like our time life drawing. Now, when you put curvatures in your spine, something happens. So here's, again, the person's face in this direction. This is backwards curvature in the neck, forward curvature by the rib cage, and the backwards curvature in the lower back. Well, when you put this back into what's called extension, or a backward bend, what happens is all these parts of the back of the vertebrae, the posterior parts, become closer together. In the vertebral column here, you have vertebral bodies that transmit the weight, and you have what are called facet joints. These are joints between the bones that guide the movement of the back and make sure everything's working properly and determine how you can move. But when you put the spine in extension, these things are all pushed together. And how is it you're going to be able to do that? Well, if you look at humans, any of you have ever taken an anthropology class and had to study bones can know that you can tell which vertebra it is in a human vertebral column by its shape. And this is a back view of the vertebra here. So these are the spinous processes, those little bumps that run up and down your spine that you can feel with your hand running up and down. So we're looking at the back view. Here's the, the sacrum back here, back by your tailbone. And these are the lower vertebrae here. And you can see these facet joints here are wider and wider and wider with every vertebra as you go down. And this is something you only see in humans. So you can tell if it's this one or this one just by looking at how wide those facet joints are. If you look at an ape, you don't see this. Um, these are both um, reconstructed CAT scan images and 3D. Our images of apes aren't as quite as precise as the ones of humans. But in the, human, in the apes, facet joints are the same all the way down. So that's a very big difference, and that's something uniquely human. And if you look at fossil hominids, sure enough, this is just one example, the facets get wider and wider and wider. So what, you're thinking, right? Where is she going with this? Well, my colleague and I were studying this, and we're trying to figure out why this happens. And what we realized is, if you try to take this ape spine, and you try to bend it backwards, and you try to push all these facet joints toward each other, they're all lined up, so they just bang into each other. And an ape, in fact, can't even bend its back. An ape can't do a back bend. It would be terrible in yoga class. But humans can do it, because what can happen is, these facets can slide past one another as they go down, and allow, the, allow us to achieve that backwards curvature. And that's key for being able to stand upright. Without it, apes just can't do it the same way we do. And we can see that even over 3 million years ago, Australopithecus had these same spinal curvatures. They'd have had that same issue with the lower back. They would have had the same curvatures. They would have stuffed just like we do. So as we were thinking about this, we thought, well, gosh, if you're going to study natural selection, you need to understand not just what a structure is good for, but what would cause, what would, what would be the problem with being an individual that wasn't built right? What would select against you? What would cause you to not make it or not have as many surviving offspring? Because that's what natural selection is. And so what we realized is this, and this is a little bit scary. I'll walk you through it. Don't panic. Okay. So what we are here, this is a sacrum, so your tailbone, your tail's down here. And these are the last two vertebrae. This is the spinous process. So this is the back of the body. You're kind of looking at an oblique view. Okay. What happens is, this is the last vertebra here, and these are the facet joints. And what happens when you try to put this whole thing as extension is the bottom facet joint from the second to last vertebra and this facet joint end up pinching this arch. Each vertebra is like a little ring that surrounds the spinal cord. And those facets end up banging right into that arch. And if they bang into the same place, something happens because they're made out of bone. Bone is a dynamic tissue. If you push on bone, it 
grows, it shrinks, it does something. It's always changing. And if you push on this ring long enough, what's going to happen is you actually dissolve the whole thing through. And the back part of the vertebra becomes unattached from the front part of the vertebra. And since you have a curvature here, there's nothing holding the front part of the vertebra from slipping out of the body, into the body cavity, out of the vertebral column. And it's a huge problem for people because your, spi your spinal cord's in here and all the nerves that run your lower limbs are trying to leave between these vertebrae. This is a modern condition called spondylolysis. Don't try to pronounce it. Um, and it's found in about 20% of people. Sometimes it's asymptomatic. But people today, some of you guys in the audience may have spondylolysis. Well, spondylolysis is a problem, as I said, because the back and the front part of the vertebra come apart, and they can slip. You can have nerve damage, you can have nerve impingements, and serious functional impairments. And it's a problem that occurs in adolescents, usually in young adolescent athletes, particularly ones that are involved in doing things that have a lot of spinal extension, like gymnasts, butterfly swimmers, handball pitchers, javelin throwers, etc. That's when your spine is growing, is during adolescence. You have these curvatures, you put your back into excess curvatures, and a lot of these kids have problems. So what we wondered is, if this is really an adaptation to having spinal curvatures, we should expect that people who do this kind of activity and have spondylolysis may not have that increase like the rest of us have. And so we went and measured it. Oh, this is cool. This is a one person. This is the same sort of view you saw. So here's the vertebrae. These are the spinous processes. This is back of the pelvis and the tailbone. This is one person, this is a young woman who was a volleyball player in St. Louis. This is a 3D reconstruction of her spine before surgery. And you can see here, she's facet joints are stacked up right on top of each other. They're not staggered. And lo and behold, she's eaten through this entire neural arch here, and she has spondylolysis. And you can even see this vertebra slipping out of alignment, which is called spondylolisthesis. And she came to the doctor because she had debilitating back pain. Fortunately, she was asymmetrical. This is the other side of the same woman. On this side, the facet joints are offset, even slightly, and she still has a little bit of bone there. So when you have that offset, you don't get spondylolysis. And you can measure this in bones, you can measure this in adults, you can measure this in kids, and you can compare people who get the disorder and people who don't. And the normal people have the increase. The spondylolytic people are people who don't have enough of an increase. And just because we're science and to prove to you that we actually measure things, you can measure things, you can do statistics, they're significantly different, and in fact, you can do this in a number of different situations, the details aren't too important here, but this is now something that clinicians are using to predict risk of people for developing this kind of disorder and some other ones, and for developing treatments to decide who needs surgery, who doesn't need surgery based on their configurations. Why do we know this? Because we were studying Lissy and how they evolved and how the spinal cord, or how the vertebral column fits together. So sometimes studying why and how the body's built the way it is can give us some insights, actually, that tell us something about modern medical conditions today and are giving clinicians insights, in fact, that are helping us improve the health of people around the world today. So that's kind of a cool story. So sometimes studying human evolution can tell us something maybe unexpected that we didn't expect about ourselves. So we know that these early hominids, if we were going to reconstruct Lucy right, would have had spinal curvatures just like ours. And maybe we know a little bit about why. But what does this mean again about Australopithecus? We talked about this rib cage, and okay, the spinal column would be right up, up right here. But what about this rib cage and this triangle shape, this big cone? What can we say about that? Well, if you look at this reconstruction, all the white parts are parts we don't have. They're made up. It's a reconstruction. And we haven't had a lot of complete rib cages in the fossil record to actually look at shape. So we have to get a little bit clever. But one thing we can do is we can look at the vertebrae because we do have a lot of those. So this is a bird's eye view of a vertebra. Here's the spinous process, the bumps on your back again. And this is the rib. So this is your back. Your belly's up to the ceiling here. And we look at a bird's eye view where the rib attaches. In a human, our ribs sweep way back and then they curve around front towards the bellies. In an ape, the ribs could have shoot straight out to the side and then curve around. And what that does is all the muscles back here that hold our back upright are situated way further back and a much better leverage for holding us up much more efficiently than in something like an ape. And so we may not have ribs, but look, here's where they're attaching to the vertebrae. This little bone here, sorry you're getting a lot of anatomy tonight, called the transverse process. And in the human, you can see it sweeps backwards like the rib. And at eight, it sticks straight out to the side. And aha, we can measure that. And if you measure that, 
Um, you can, modern animals, you can measure it in the fossils. These are two vertebrae of Australopithecus afarensis, and we can measure the angle of where this would be. And we can plot it out in a graph because we're nerdy scientists. And here's what you see. So these are, these are vertebrae, and this is its angle. And you see the smaller the angle, the more the ribs are going to sweep backwards. Here's an ape up here. Here's humans, and here's Australopithecus, way at the end of the human range. So that we know that they had a vertebral column that was invaginated like that, and their ribs would have swept backwards. And so the cross-sectional shape of the rib cage wouldn't have been very much like an ape. It would have been very much like ours. This shows that those spinal extensors are further back, they're standing upright, and they had maybe a more human-like rib cage. Um, this skeleton was found in 2010 and published by Johannes Haile Selassie and his colleagues. And this is another skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis. It's a big male. His name is Katanumu. And Katanumu is important because he actually has some complete ribs. And the discoverers of this measured the curvature of the rib and how much they curved back and around by using a simple ratio of some measurements. And they plotted it out. And here's humans and Katanumu way down here. And here's chimps and gorillas. So Katanumu seems to have rib curvatures like we would have expected from the vertebrae, like us. But the fact that they're different from chimps and gorillas is good, but chimps and gorillas differ because they climb trees and hang below branches, and we don't, so maybe it has to do with climbing. They also have a cone-shaped thoracic cage, and we don't, so maybe it has to do with thoracic cage. So it's a little bit hard to say. So what my student, undergrad student Sarah Bartlett did is we went out and we got a whole bunch more species, and we measured curvature in a whole bunch more species, and we put some more on the graph. And what we see is we added orangutans, chimps and gorillas, all of these guys have, this, have this, the ribs that don't curve around as much. They're not all knuckle walkers, but they do all hang by the trees. So all the great apes are different. We did see that gibbons are very much like humans and katanumu. And gibbons are the small apes that do the hand-over-hand -hand brachiation, so they're great in the trees. So this rib curvature doesn't have anything to do with climbing. We know it doesn't have much to do with knuckle walking because orangutans aren't really knuckle walkers. What this seems to have to do with is rib cage shape, because gibbons have a rib cage that's shaped like ours. So this is pretty good evidence that the rib cage of Katanuma would have been shaped like ours as well. So this was a sort of now iconic drawing published by um, Dan Lieberman and his colleagues in 2004, and it shows a chimp and a human and his idea of what Lucy would have looked like. And if you look at this Lucy, here's that torso that looks just like the chimp. Big bulgy belly, cone-shaped rib cage, not particularly human-like. So I don't have the artistic skills of some other people in the audience today, but I got a Photoshop, and I improved, I think, I improved Lucy. So I call her my new and improved Lucy. And the changes that I made were to add a nice long lower weight. She has a long lower back here, so I gave her a waist, because she would have had a bit of a waist. There's a big gap between her rib cage and her pelvis with that spinal curvature. And I gave her a more human-shaped rib cage, which again lends a much more human-like body shape to Lucy than we would have thought. And actually, just because I couldn't help it, I also put arches in her feet because we found foot bones and we know that she actually had arches in her feet, so I couldn't help that one too. So if you look at my new and improved Lucy, I call her, it's a much more human-like, short and stocky, longer arms to be sure, but a much more human-like body shape than we previously appreciated. Not a big gut, would have had plenty of waist for rotation and walking, and really much more similar to us than we would have thought. So if we go back to our time life drawing, I think we can now do this. We can get rid of that. That's not really correct. They wouldn't have been hunched forward, and they certainly wouldn't have been as ape-like as some of the other reconstructions as well. So sorry time life drawing, sorry funny com comics, maybe not as accurate as we thought. But this lent to me to think, you know, if we weren't sort of still hunched over, was our ancestor really like a chimp walking around all fours or not? And that's where I'd like to talk about next. Do we really, did we really come from an ancestor like this? We take the beginning of this diagram, is it accurate or not? Now, if you look around the world today and you do great comparative biology, you see that all of our living relatives, all of the apes, gibbons, siamangs, orangutans, gorillas, and chimps, and bonobos, are different from humans in certain ways. And they all hang below branches, and they've got the long arms, and so on and so forth. So it's perfectly reasonable to assume that we would have come from an ancestor that was pretty much like that in terms of body shape, or in general. Also, these animals, because they're so specialized for hanging below branches, as I mentioned, when they come down to the ground, don't really walk around on two feet. Well, some of them have to. Gibbons have such long arms, they have to, but they don't come to the ground very much. 
but they have this very unique way of walking that is, that is a result of their climbing adaptations. And we know that the ancestors of these animals are very monkey-like. Monkeys are different from apes because monkeys walk around on all fours on tops of branches. So what apes do is really different. And this it seems very nice story that hanging below branches is what characterized this whole group and only one set of oddballs changed it at the end of um, this one branch of the family tree. Well, that's all good until you go back to the fossil record and you look at a time period before hominids. And that's when the real planet of the apes was. Um, in the time period before hominids appeared, so hominids appeared around five to eight million years ago, depending on which geneticist you talk to, um, and the fossil record seems to largely support that as well. Um, but before that, from a period of about 22 million years ago, up till that time, there were hundreds and hundreds of great ape species that lived all over the old world, in Africa, in Asia, and in Europe. And there was lots of them, and they were very different from the, the few relic apes that we have left today. And we can go back to that fossil record to try to reconstruct what happened during these branches on the fossil tree. And so if you go back early in time, this is just an example of one of these animals called proconsul. We have pelvises, we have heads, we have almost all the bones. And all these guys walked above the branches like a monkey. So the earliest apes, we know there were apes based on their heads and teeth, they weren't hanging in the trees. Then there I mentioned, there are a whole bunch of these things. I'm just going to call them stem hominoids because there's too many to talk about. You would really be asleep. Um, that live back here, and they're all pretty similar. All these above branch things. So hanging in the trees is something that happened after that early Miocene. We know once you get up to six or seven million years ago and thereafter, we get animals that were at least being all or at least partly bipedal on two feet. And we've got a whole bunch of other ones in between, and this is really only a handful because I got tired of typing Pithecus on my slide and I ran out of room. Um, but for example, this one from Shiva Pithecus from Pakistan is pretty clearly an orangutan relative. They're, near, they're very, very similar from the neck up. But we know that Shiva Pithecus walked around like these stem hominoids on all fours. So orangutans must have evolved this weird way of hanging below branches independently. We know that some of these other early, or these middle Miocene apes, also walked on all fours like a monkey and like an early stem hominoid. So that means given that Siamangs evolved hanging below branches separately. Which then leads us to wonder, gee, what happens up here with the African hominoids, with African ape and human clade? And we have some animals, particularly from Europe, from the latest part of the Miocene from a nine million years ago or so, that we think are fairly closely related to the African ape and human ancestor, that seem to start looking a little bit more suspensory. And in particular, there's one animal called Rudopithecus, named from a site called Rudabanya in Hungary, that seems to be fairly closely related to African apes and humans based on the heads and the teeth. And most importantly, we have a pelvis. This is a pelvis of Rudopithecus, and yeah, it's a little broken up in the fossil record. We don't always have beautiful fossils. This was found by David Begun and Lazar Kordos in Rudabanya in 2006. And this is one side of the pelvis here. You see the hip socket and parts of it. A little bit of it is missing, and there's a piece from the other side. And this is really a significant fossil because it's closely related to African apes and humans and because it's a pelvis, which is a really informative bone, especially about, you guessed it, body shape. Um, as I mentioned, the torso is particularly important, and the pelvis is part of the whole torso, and the shape of the pelvis reveals the shape of this whole torso. Okay? It also forms part of the hip joint, so it tells us about something about how limbs move. And if you look across... Um, Anthropoid primates, you'll see that some animals hold their bodies in an upright or orthograde position, while some are on all fours. Some animals hang below branches. Some animals walk on top of branches, on the trees or on the ground. Some walk on two feet or four feet. Some hang below the branches and move their limbs way out to the side. So the pelvis should be able to tell about all these different ways of moving around. And since how you move around has changed so much within ape evolution, it should be a really important key to understanding how the whole process happened. And that's going to help tell us where our hominids came from. This will come back to hominids, I promise. Okay, so um, one thing you can do is you can look at hip mobility. And this is the work of my former student, Ashley Hammond, who was able to, thanks to the marvels of scanning technology and funding from the Leakey Foundation to her and to us, we were able to take laser scanners and make 3D digital models of the bones. And we took pelvises and we took the thigh bone or the femur, and she could digitally articulate the hip joint and move it around through its range of motion. And if you look at a monkey here, this is, the orange to the purple here indicates the range of motion. 
A monkey leg is pretty well tucked underneath the body because it's walking around on top of the branches compared to this siamang here, this ape. And you can see here its range of motion, the knees can go way out to the side. Because if you're an ape moving around, you've got to reach your feet all the way over to the next support to pull yourself over when you're being suspensory. And if you look at Rudapithecus, sure enough, it's got a range of motion with much more flexible lower limbs than the monkey did. So it's looking like a pretty suspensory animal, which isn't surprising since it's closely related to African apes and humans. We can also, using these digital models, measure the distribution of the joint surfaces. And the distribution of joint surfaces tell us how an animal's loading something. If you want to distribute your weight over a wide area to decrease the pressure on the cartilage so the cartilage doesn't get damaged, because cartilage can never regrow, and if you have bad knees, you need a good orthopedic surgeon because they're never going to heal on their own, right? So an animal that's going to load a joint a lot makes a big surface to load it. And you can measure how much surface is up at the top of the acetabulum, and you would see in an ape that holds its body upright, the top part of the hip joint has a wide surface area. In a monkey that walks around on all fours, the surface is pretty evenly distributed because it's moving its limbs just like this through this range of motion. And you can measure the size of the top and size of the bottom, and you can plot it out. And just as a warning, maybe this is some sort of disclaimer for the younger and less and more sensitive viewers, I'm going to show you a bunch of graphs because I think it's important to show you guys not just what we know about human evolution, but sometimes how we know it. So, so bear with me. You don't have to read the details. I'll give you the big picture. Um, so if you plot it out, you can measure the, the relative thickness here in a bunch of different animals. And all these are apes and humans and Afri apes and simangs and so forth. And they have a big joint surfaces on the top, whereas the monkeys have even all the way around. Here's Rudapithecus and the red star. This is Proconsul, one of the stem hominoids that looks like a monkey. Um, these purple guys over here, the semi-suspensory New World monkeys, they're kind of a, interesting to talk about. I'm happy to talk about them later. But certainly Rudapithecus has a wide surface up at the top, so we can tell that this was not just a suspensory animal moving its limbs in a variety of positions, but it was upright. It held its body in an upright position, not on all fours. That's looking pretty ape-like. Now, what about body shape? This is another set of rib cages. I can't show enough pictures of rib cages. Um, this time it's a bird's eye view, so you're looking top down in the rib cage. This is the shoulder blade, and the red area here is where the arm would go, okay, the humerus, the upper arm bone. So in a monkey that's walking around on all fours, the shoulder joints are facing the floor. And joints are slick. They're covered with slick articular cartilage, so they have to be oriented normal or perpendicular to how they're being loaded. So if a monkey's loading its limbs underneath it, its joints are facing down, and then it can resist the load. An ape, on the other hand, has its shoulders turned out to the side because when you're reaching and pulling, all the muscles now that are at reaching and pulling your arm are now running in a side-to-side -side direction, and they're pulling your limbs like this, which is the motion you do when you're pulling around in the trees. So the shoulder joints are faced outside, up to the side to resist that motion. The monkey shoulder joints can resist motion when you're walking this way, and all the muscles then that are moving the limb are in this sort of parasagittal position, so they're going to move your limbs like this. So the rib cage in a monkey is narrow, so the shoulder blades can sit in the side of the body and put the shoulders in that position. And the story goes, in ape evolution, those shoulder blades swung out to the side, and the rib cage widened out with it to support the shoulder blades to position the shoulders to hang below branches. This goes back to Adolf Schultz. These are his drawings from the 50s, famous anatomist. These are actual reconstructions of CT scans of modern cadavers that I've been doing in my lab. And you can see the rib cage here of the monkey is much narrower than the rib cage shape here in the ape. This one happens to be an orangutan. And importantly here, notice the pelvis here. And the ape is wide, it's flaring out to the side, and it's in a transverse position where the monkey pelvis is narrower and sits in the side, just like the shoulder blades. So the pelvis should tell us something about rib cage shape. So let's go back to the pelvis. Now, the Rudapithecus fossil is a bit fragmentary, so we have to be a little bit clever about how we measure things. But fortunately, we can, thanks to the 3D scanning technology and CAD software that's out there. So this is the hip socket here. We want to look at uh, it's in, hip sockets facing about the same way in everybody. So what we can do is we can define the edges and fit a digital plane through the hip socket. Then we can take the preserved part intact, undistorted part of the top part of the pelvis, called the ilium, and we can fit a plane through that, and then we can measure the angle of these planes to each other to see how much is that iliac blade rotated, how much is that pelvis rotated to match the rib cage. And you put one of these awful looking plots again. Here's this angle. Apes are up here, and they have a very high angle because that pelvis is rotated around sort of with that rib cage. 
whereas the monkeys don't. Here's Rudopithecus up here, and actually, I think this is Lucy, showing that that rib cage would have looked very, very ape-like. So this whole thing's looking pretty ape-like. We can also measure how flaring it is. Usually measure how wide the pelvis is by taking your calipers and measuring how wide the pelvis is, but um, we aren't that lucky and the, the top part of the pelvis is missing, but you can measure how curved it is. The tighter, you can fit a circle using your CAD software. The tighter the, tighter the circle, the smaller the circle, the more curved it is. The more curved it is, the more it's flaring out, and the wider it's gonna be if it was preserved. And you can plot that out too in a couple of different ways. Apes here have very small circles, depending how you standardize them, as does Rudopithecus, whereas monkeys have much flatter, straighter iliac blades, which are narrower. So Rudopithecus is looking like an ape. Da 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 da, right? It's getting monotonous. So this is seeming like a pretty suspensory, ape-like animal in terms of how it's rearranged its shoulder joints, how it can move its limbs, how it can hold its body. But there's one other thing that's distinctive about apes, and that is in their lower back. I showed you this a little bit before. When a monkey takes a drink of water here, these are Adolf Schultz's pictures again, it can curve its back, so it's got a long, flexible spine. We have a pretty long, flexible spine, too. Apes, great apes don't. They have a very long pelvis and almost no lower back vertebrae, and they can't even bend at the waist. And you can look at real animals and see exactly the same thing. They're really stiff, so a chimp or gorilla cannot do a back bend no matter what, as I mentioned. So the pelvis here in ape sort of slides up the back, if you will, and so the back is stiff because you've got this long pelvis. And it's really important for great apes, especially great apes which are really, really big animals, two, three, four hundred pounds or more, to be able to hold that back stiff because you don't want to have to use muscles to protect the spinal cord, which is running up and down your backbone. So they stiffen up the back, and it also provides a really stiff platform for all the muscles that move your limbs. When you, when you pull yourself up, that muscle that moves the limb goes all the way down to that pelvis. And so you want a really stiff platform from that, and that's what great apes do. So you should be able to measure the length of Rudopithecus pelvis and see, was it long also? And we would expect it to be, wouldn't we? Because the whole thing looks like a great ape in other ways. So here's great apes with a very long pelvis. Here's monkeys with a short pelvis. Uh-oh, there's Rudopithecus. It doesn't have a long pelvis. It doesn't have that really long pelvis, which means it then also wouldn't have had the reduced lower back vertebrae, and it wouldn't have had that stiff torso like a modern ape. So now it's not exactly like your chimp or your gorilla or your orangutan. And that's something we haven't seen before in the fossil record. So if you put, you take a look at monkeys, here's a couple of generic monkeys with a long, narrow torso, short pelvis. Here's a great ape, wide pelvis, short back, long pelvis, your wide, long pelvis here. There's gibbons and siamangs. These are the lesser apes, the smaller apes. Gibbons weigh maybe 15, 20 pounds, 15 pounds or so. Siamangs are more like cocker spaniel sized animals with long limbs, maybe up to 30 or 40 pounds or something. 30, well, no, 20, 30 pounds, something like that. And they have a flaring pelvis, but it's also shorter and they have a more flexible spine. They have the same number of vertebrae in their lower back as we do. And if you take the Rudopithecus pelvis, and you're clever with Photoshop, or not even very clever with Photoshop, what you realize is it's in all ways a lot like a Siamang lower back. These are these lesser apes that are not nearly as big as a great ape, and the shape and size and length of it is very much like that. These are arboreal animals. They're upright. They climb in trees. They hang below branches. But they're not as anatomically specialized in their lower back and their pelvis as a great ape. But they don't have to be because they're smaller. So maybe Rudopithecus, if you imagine that this pelvis has something to do with the whole rest of the body, we know it had a wide rib cage, something like the Siamang. This might be more of what it looked like. And since it's closely related to the African ape and human ancestor, it's not unreasonable to hypothesize or think that maybe this might be a good ancestral or hypothesis of what the ancestral body shape would have been also. It's not unlike ours. We have a short pelvis. We have a flexible back. We have a relatively wide upper rib cage. So this might make a better model for the ancestral condition from which we evolved. So if we go back to our diagram here, here's our stem hominoids walking around above branches. We know through the middle Miocene they were still pretty much similar. Now only later do we start to get Rudopithecus and some other animals that are suspensory and seem to be behaving a lot like a modern ape, but they weren't quite as specialized in the way they're built. But maybe they didn't have to be. None of these guys were as big. You know, chimpanzee is going to be... 80, 90, 100 pounds, and then up the rest of the great apes. All these animals are smaller in the fossil record. They don't get up above 70 pounds, and that's the big males. 
And if you're bigger, the bigger you get, the exponentially more complicated mechanical problem it is to support your body weight when you get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's something called allometry. The bigger you get, the bigger problem you have with negotiating the trees. And the more extremely you have to be built to be able to do the same thing you could have done with a more generalized body build at smaller size. So it may be that great apes are built the way they are, partly because they do what they do, but partly because they do it at such enormous body sizes. So it could be that maybe great apes are just the really extreme body build for these animals that would have been behaving fairly similar, but with a more generalized body build all the way along. And these are some reconstruction of some of these Miocene apes that would have been fairly upright, and they would have moved around the trees by hanging and climbing and so forth. And it's not unreasonable to imagine that when they moved on the ground, they would have moved much like they do on the trees, perhaps also still upright. And if you imagine for a moment then that we came from something like this, and that might be a more better condition for the ancestor, you get a different picture of human evolution. And this is not unreasonable where I'm going to go with this also because Ardipithecus, that even earlier hominid that came before Australopithecus, seems to be partly upright but not nearly as anatomically specialized for climbing as we see in something like a chimp or gorilla. So imagine for a moment that the ancestor of Australopithecus and hominids was something that was built in a more general body plan than we see in great apes. and wasn't nearly as specialized, didn't have to be because their ancestors weren't that large. And we need to remember that we have been evolving for five to eight million years, but so have chimpanzees and gorillas. And what seems as, as body size increased in both those lineages, which we're pretty sure it did from looking at the fossil record, their anatomical specializations also increased in parallel, like it did in orangutans, to achieve what we see is similar today, but maybe evolved independently. And in humans, perhaps our ancestors never specialized to live on three ripe fruits at the end of the branches. We know that Australopithecus was able to eat a much more general diet. They weren't specialized for eating ripe fruits on the ends of trees and forests. Could eat anything they want, could go anywhere they wanted. Didn't need to specialize anatomically for hanging in the trees, and instead specialized for moving around upright on the ground. And so maybe these new data are beginning to suggest to us that the entire question about human origins that we've been asking is not right. Maybe we should no longer be asking, why did we stand up from all fours and walk on two feet? Maybe we should be asking, why did we never drop down all fours to begin with? And that's a really different way about thinking about hominin origins. We don't have the smoking gun yet, but I think more and more evidence that we're getting is beginning to suggest that at least this is a really worthwhile question asking. Because after all, if we're going to get the right answers about human evolution, we need to ask the right questions. And I think enough data are beginning to show that we need to start asking this kind of a question to see if it's going to take us anywhere and give us a better idea where we came from. Because after all, that transition of bipedal locomotion is the first thing that happened that was really distinctive, except for maybe some changes in diet, um, in the evolution of Australopithecus, which led to things like tool use and everything else that comes after Australopithecus. But it's understanding that transition, or that transition to being good bipedal locomotion um, by the locomotors, I guess, that presets all of what we're going to see in later human evolution, and I think is a really important question. So if we go back to the fossil record and look at it this way, we may be getting some new answers, we may be getting some new questions, which will lead us to maybe more interesting new answers, and I think you know, there are a lot more fossils being found, there's an enormous boom of fossils being found, and I think we're going to have um, a lot of exciting finds, things to come. That's why I do, for example, go out in the field and try to find fossils earliest Australopithecus, I wish we had a pelvis, we don't yet. Um, in Kenya, that's why Zariah's out in the field just getting back yesterday from the field in Ethiopia looking for more fossils. And I think as we get more fossils, we'll be able to test some of these ideas and find out um, really if this is a good way to look at human evolution or not. But I certainly think it's worthwhile. What are we going to find in the next few years? We don't really know. But I think um, getting out there in the lab and doing more comparative morphology, getting out there in the field and finding more fossils, and approaching it all with new methods and new techniques with new questions is going to give us a much better idea of where we evolved than we have had in the past. And I'd just like to end by thanking um, the Leakey Foundation for providing this evening and inviting me out here, like Cal Academy, who I didn't get the logo up there, I feel very remiss, uh, for hosting all of this, and other funding agencies we won't really mention out loud for funding all of this, institutions that gave us access to fossils, and a lot of people, many of whose names are probably forgotten on this list that have helped me with all of this. 
But I'd mostly like to thank you guys for your time and attention and for coming out tonight and hear about um, my work on human evolution and where I think it's going. Thank you.